Hi, John here. In this video, we're going to look at the cross flow cooling tower. We'll look at some of the components and then I'm going to explain to you exactly how it works. Here we have a cross flow cooling tower. We can see on the back that we've opened it up so we can see exactly what's happening. And if we keep spinning around, then you get the view of the entire tower. So let's start with the flow of the water. Water is let into the tower through these two pipes. We have one pipe here and we have another pipe over here. When the water enters through these pipes, it's actually going to spread out and it's going to cover this entire space. So this entire area here, this entire chamber, will be full of water. What actually happens is the water comes in through the pipe and if we look above the cooling tower, we should be able to see a couple of panels. And here are the panels that were removed from the main model and they'd normally be bolted onto these two areas here and we would close off that area and then fill it with water. So the water comes in we fill up this entire compartment and then the water is going to escape and drip through these holes. You can see the holes are all quite spread out. And when it drips through the holes, it's actually going to pass to spray nozzles. Now I'll go over the other side so we can see it a little bit better. Maybe there's a bit more light. And there's our spray nozzle. So the water comes down, it impinges upon this plate and then the water is spread out over a large area and it drips onto the fill. Now let me just back out a moment. I'll see if we can get a bit more light. We can see the fill is this black section here and it's hexagonal in shape. The fill is effectively a heat exchanger. So the water comes down through the nozzles into the heat exchanger and then it will drip down due to gravity and it will go into the base of the cooling tower. You can actually see the reservoir of the cooling tower is this section here. And this whole section is full of water. So this is where the water drips down to. And that is the entire path of the water as it passes through the cooling tower. It will then be discharged through this main suction hole here and a pump will take suction and it will pull the water out and the cooling water will pass through the process again and then it will be returned to the top of the cooling tower. So that is the path of the water. Let's now go and have a look at the path of the air. Now notice we've got a fan on the top of the cooling tower and the fan is drawing air through the tower. So it's an induced draft type cooling tower because the air is passing over the heat exchanger or the fill before it passes over the fan. So the path of the air is as follows. We have the air coming in. In fact, if I spin it around, we can also see the label. We have an air inlet and the air passes in and it goes through the louvres. The louvres are these sloped blades here. And that allows the air to pass in whilst also keeping out foreign bodies or animals, rodents, birds and things like that. Once the air passes through the louvres, it's going to pass through the fill. And once it's passed through the fill, it's going to go through a drift eliminator. Now the drift eliminator here allows the air and evaporated water to pass through. But some of that evaporated water is going to impinge upon these blades and we can see the shape here. So some of the vapor as it comes out is going to impinge upon the blades of the drift eliminator and drip down back into the base of the cooling tower. The air, now less laden with moisture, is going to pass up and out through the top of the cooling tower and it's going to pass through the fan. So we go up and out there, and that is the complete path of the air. So we've got the air coming in from the sides through here, and then the air is going to pass out through the top of the tower. We've got the water coming and dripping down through the fill and going to the base of the tower. 
The air and the water are coming into contact with each other, but at a 90 degree angle. So their flow paths are actually going to be across from each other. They're going to cross flow. They're going to flow across each other. And that's where the cooling tower gets its name. So the air will flow across the water. And as it flows across the water in the fill, some of that water is going to evaporate. And because the water is evaporating, it actually cools the water molecules surrounding it. And these cooled water molecules then drop into the base of the cooling tower. Whilst the evaporated water molecules pass through the drift eliminator, some will impinge upon the drift eliminator, but those that don't impinge on the drift eliminator will pass up and out of the tower. And we'll see this as a column or a plume of moisture that is exiting the tower. This water plume is drift and it represents a water loss. If you have a lot of drift coming out the top of the tower, then you're actually losing a lot of money. Water nowadays is quite expensive. So if you have a lot of that water leaving, perhaps 2%, 2.5%, just drifting up and out of the tower, then you're gonna incur additional operating costs. So we definitely don't want this. We wanna operate the cooling tower efficiently and at a low cost. Since we're here, we may as well look at some other components in the cooling tower that allow it to operate effectively. If we go down into the base, we can see that we've actually got a weird kind of ball float mechanism over here. This float mechanism actually allows the lever, this entire lever here, to travel up and down. As it travels up and down, it's going to control the amount of water that's let into the cooling tower. The water that's let in is known as makeup water because we're making up for our losses. Our losses may be due to leakage, may be due to evaporation or drift, and we need to replace that water so that the cooling tower doesn't run dry. And in order to do that effectively, we have this proportional response device, this float, which will move up and down, depending on where the water level is within the cooling tower, and it's gonna open or close a water inlet valve, which is actually housed in this section here. So you've got to imagine normally there'd be a trickle of water coming out of here, but as the lever pushes upwards, we'll close that off. And as the lever falls downwards, as the water level lowers in the cooling tower, then we're gonna allow more and more water to come in through this pipe. If we go down, right down into the reservoir, we can see our water outlet. That's this large pipe here. We have another outlet here. And if I actually back out, we'll be able to see the labels here. We can see that we've got a makeup water inlet. That was the pipe that we were looking at from the inside. We've got our water outlet. That is our main suction pipe. That's the fat pipe here. And we have an overflow, which will usually go to a designated drain or some sort of tank where we can recapture the water if there is an overflow situation. And the overflow should usually be alarmed as well. So that if we get an overflow, it'll alert the operators and they can investigate why we have an overflow situation. And it's most likely something basic like the makeup water level valve, which we saw inside here. Perhaps the valve that's housed within this pipe is actually stuck, perhaps it got dirty, and that's allowing some of the water just to travel into the cooling tower and overfill it over time. These things do happen and that's why you have an overfill pipe. There is one additional connection, which we can see on the other side, and that is our drain. The drain you will use to control these cycles of concentration. Occasionally you will need to drain down some of the dissolved salts and any sediment that may have accumulated in the bottom of the tower. And in order to do that, you will use the drain. So the drain is very important to ensure that your cycles of concentration are maintained at the correct level. And that is how a cross-flow induced draft cooling tower works. If you want to learn more about cooling towers, then check out our two and a half hour long introduction to cooling towers course. You can find the link to this in the video description area. And if you want to learn more about engineering in general, then go to the video description area, check out some of the links there, and you'll see links to some of our many engineering video courses. If you like this video, then please do share it or like it on social media. It really does help us out and allows us to produce more and more content. 
Thanks very much for your time.